started to stream it live on Facebook, YouTube. And I said, okay, there'll probably be about eight people that watch online. And these programs that we've been having as part of the Distinguished Speaker Series and otherwise, there have been over a thousand people to tune in. So um, there are more than a hundred people expected tonight. Thank you. And we'll reach much more online. So thanks for your, your patience with that. Um, I'd like to really thank everybody in attendance and particularly the friends of Drayton Hall. Those of you that are friends of Drayton Hall, you play an integral role in the preservation of Drayton Hall, but also in bringing forth presentations like tonight. Also significant tonight is the South Carolina Humanities Council, who has supported our Distinguished Speaker Series, of which tonight is a part of. Last and not least, do want to thank the staff of Drayton Hall for all the work that they have done to put together tonight's presentation and others. Um, I'd say it looks seamless, it looks easy, and I thank you all. Now, without further ado, would like to introduce Mitch Owens, tonight's speaker. Mitch has been the Decorative Arts Editor of Architectural Digest since 2011, but has had a lifelong passion for many of the things that obsessed George IV, including French furniture and porcelain, fantastical architecture, and Savile Row tailors. An alumnus of South Carolina's Coker College, Mitch has written about all that and more for Architectural Digest, The New York Times, The World of Interiors, and other international publications, and has been working far too long on a biography of 1960s tastemaker Pauline de Rothschild. The books that Mitch has managed to com complete on time include fabulous The Dazzling Interiors of Tom Britt, a 2017 Rizzoli publication, and In-House, a 2009 Rizzoli book about British photographer Derry Moore's images of iconic interiors around the world. When he's not, not gently asking for yet another deadline extension or leading Architectural Digest tours abroad in association with Indigrave, he can be found in Cooperstown, New York, where he lives with his husband, three children, four dogs, and two cats. Without further ado, let's welcome Mitch. Thank you all. It's very alarming to know that this is on YouTube. Um, uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here this evening. I'm very pleased that you all are here. And I want to thank very much Drayton Hall. Um, although I went to college in South Carolina, I never managed to set foot onto the Drayton Hall property until today. And I am thrilled. I know it's shocking. Um, and, and I will live, I will take a long time to live that down. Um, I think it's one of the most extraordinary places I've ever been in my whole life. And I'm sure that all of you or many of you have supported that property. And I want to thank you all for what you have done for Drayton Hall. And it, it really was incredibly exciting to be there today. And, um, Thank you all. I'm very happy to be in Charleston as well, where I haven't been in a, in a very long time. Um, I'm delighted to talk about George IV, who in various aspects of his life was the Prince of Wales, um, was the Prince Regent, was the King of England, was commonly known as Prinny, um, and who I, I find a really interesting character because I think most of, most of us are only interested in characters who are difficult. And he sort of falls under that heading. Um, uh, at the age of 50 in England, um, the various newspapers said, re re described him as the subject of millions of shrugs and reproaches. A reputed, reputed, reputed Adonis of loveliness, and then went on to describe him as a violator of his work, a libertine overhead and ears in debt, and disgrace, a despiser of domestic ties, the companion of gamblers and demi-reps, a man who was, 
who has just closed half a century without one single claim on the gratitude of his country or the respect of posterity. Imagine being 50 years old and reading that in your local newspaper. Um, uh, and, and so I'm, I, we, right now we went to see this beautiful portrait of, of the prince of, of, he was then the uh, king at the time, uh, George IV, painted by Sir Thomas Lawrence, an unfinished portrait, and I can completely understand the incredibly raised collar, um, which will hide all sorts of double chins, etc. Um, the hair is dyed, it is a wig. Um, but he was all about the presentation. And I think that's sort of a great deal of what we admire about the Regency era, is the way um, it was presented, it was a stagecraft, it was theatricality. And as a young man, here he is. Um, imagine this, imagine getting up every damned morning and you're, you're at the moment in your life where uh, the British newspapers, printing is very cheap, newspapers are very cheap, um, <clears throat> satirists are as mean as they can be. Um, so here you have the Prince of Wales. Um, you can just see outside the windows the incomplete colonnade at Carlton House, his house. He's picking his teeth with a, an unfinished meal. Um, up in the above his head, you see sort of an ascetic Italian of the 16th century, sort of trying to cast. A, 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 an example over him of if you would only behave and not eat quite so much and behave as a human being out to you the crest that the um, utterest Cruikshank has made of a crossed fork and knife. Um, so, so he's really, he really is this extraordinary character and who's, 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 who's as well liked as he is loathed. Um, I want to tell you a, a, a comment. The Duchess of Devonshire, uh, Georgina Devonshire, who was a great friend of his and an aesthetic um, ad admirer and helped him with his houses. She describes him after first meeting him. The Prince of Wales is rather tall and has a figure which though striking is not perfect. He is inclined to be too fat and looks too much like a woman in men's clothes. His face is rather handsome, and he is fond of dress even to a tawdry degree. He loves being of consequence. And I think this is sort of a, a, a tremendous problem that we see with all princes of Wales. You're sort of stuck on a treadmill. You're sort of a hamster on a wheel waiting for your mother or your father to drop dead. And up until that point, you don't know really what to do with yourself. So to our great delight this evening, not only did he have um, masses of mistresses and um, uh, love wine and love food and love clothes and love furniture, but he created really beautiful interiors. Um, but we'll point out a little bit of the crazy satirists. And here he is on his birthday in 1812. He was teased not only mercilessly about his weight, but the uh, shape of the women that he liked to be with. Um, so here you see him at Carlton House um, with what is apparently the in rather rotund Marchioness of Jersey and everyone looking rather bored out of their minds. And he's sort of heavily made up, as you can see, and spilling his wine. Here we have this glorious Gilray of, um, he is with Lady Hartford on the right, long-term mistress, slightly, he tended to like rather older ladies. Um, and she is tending to his gouty left leg and saying to him basically, you need to stop drinking so much, you need to stop eating so much. And his wife is peering around the corner, saying, his wife, Caroline, peering around the corner saying, no, no, let him eat what he wants. Let him eat, <laughs> let him drink what he wants. Um, and he's, of course, torn between the two. I love the bottles of wine under the table. Um, he really seemed to have absolutely no self-control. Um, here he is on the left at the time of his coronation. 
Um, and he's horrified because Caroline, whom he loathed, um, his first cousin from Germany, uh, he was trying to block her, as you all know, from the coronation. Westminster Abbey was locked. She knocked on the door. Uh, she was told that only ticket holders were allowed. <laughs> she said, but I am the queen, whereupon the guard said, do you have a ticket? <laughs> and she eventually had to go home uh, because he would not allow her into the building. Um, and it, you have to imagine at this point, he is so in debt, it's unbelievable. Uh, it's easily a million pounds in debt by this time. Uh, so much so that he didn't even own his own diamonds. Uh, on the upper right, you see his coronation crown, which he helped design, and which there, of which there are more than 14,000 diamonds in it, all of which were rented for the occasion. Um, and then you see the frame below, which is at the Tower of London, showing it San diamonds, because they had to be sent back after the coronation. But one of the things I thought was incredibly interesting today at, at, at Drayton Hall, um, I, I was watching a video and there was a wonderful observation that you cannot know where someone's taste comes from unless you know who their parents are. And here we see Zophany's beautiful uh, conversation piece of Queen Charlotte on the right. Um, George III in the center, George IV, the future George IV on the right in the red cape, and um, there were easily 10 more children to arrive, um, but George IV was brought up in a very restrained, very gemutlich, very familial world. Um, George III uh, was reacting against his own father, the late Prince of Wales, Frederick, who was very fashionable and had lots of fashionable fancy friends. And he didn't want that life. And he did not want that life for his children. Um, Queen Charlotte was from a very provincial court in Northwestern Germany. And she was heavily concerned about what Britain thought about her. So she was extremely, extremely proper. She never stepped out of line. She never did anything wrong. She never set a foot wrong, um, which meant that she was a deep, deep bore. Um, but she was a, a, apparently a good mother. Um, she adored her children. She seemed to have one every 10 months. Um, and, uh, and George III adored her. Her children adored her. Um, I do think what's, what's, what's rather sad is that George IV, when he was eight years old, he asked for a, a purse, a wallet, sort of to hold his coins, and he was given that. But then his mother also gave him a letter, um, the sort of present one doesn't want at eight years old, um, explaining to him that he was going to be the head of the nation someday. He needed to adore his father. He needed to listen to his father. He needed to never do anything wrong. I grew up in the military, so I, I relate to that letter. Um, don't do anything wrong that's going to cast aspersions on your father. Now you have to imagine a very lively boy, very intelligent, not too terribly focused, um, but, but having your mother send you a letter like this at the age of eight um, is, is sort of deflating. So George was brought up at St. James's Palace in London, nothing especially wonderful at that moment, rather rambling, rather medieval, um, nothing fancy in the slightest. And then he was also brought up at the White House on the top of this slide, out at Kew Gardens. Uh, below is one of the few buildings that is left from that moment, um, known as, it was then known as the Dutch House. It's now commonly known as, as Kew Palace. He took his uh, lessons there. He was, he, he had his, uh, he, and he was a very smart boy. He loved astronomy. He loved art. He loved music. Um, he was not an A student, but he was enthusiastic. But the idea was that his family wanted him to be away from the set. They did not want him to be sucked into a group of people who were going to lead him astray. 
um, they wanted a very proper, proper boy. And of course, he turned out to be completely different than this. As, as, as many men in this audience surely know um, of, of turning your back on what your father wants and what your parents want. You want to be something different and you want to be what you're not allowed to be. And that is what George IV um, ended up becoming. Now, I know we have all of this, we all know about George IV as being fat and f covered with makeup and whatever. And he was not, he was not dreadful looking as a young man. Um, although he was, he, he would have sat for any portrait. Anytime anyone raised a brush, he would sit down. Um, he loved being painted. He loved fancy costumes. Um, he loved military costumes, especially, although he never served in any capacity as a military officer. He never went into battle. He never saw blood, except when he accidentally stabbed himself. Um, he, never, he never did any of this, but he loved being painted. So here you see him at about 18 on the left-hand side and about 20. Um, you know, in, in the sort of the flush of youth, and as you can see, as, 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 as Georgiana Devonshire pointed out, he looks a bit like a woman in men's clothes, um, but very handsome nonetheless. Um, he loved women. He adored women. He loved, he fell in love for the first time at the age of 16 with a 20 year old courtesan. Um, here you see him at the, um, on the right hand side is Mrs. Fitzherbert, who is an incredibly fascinating character of the Regency, very discreet, twice widowed Catholic. She wanted really nothing to do with him. He was fascinated by her, by her, not by her beauty because she was not especially beautiful, but she was discreet, she was intelligent, she was wildly charming. On the left, you see the locket that he had made for her. He had a matching one um, and she wore it until her death. He wore hers until his death. Um, and what I find really lovely, and this sort of tells you a bit about his extravagance, is that is not a glass cover over his miniature. It is a table cut diamond. And he requested in his will that that be around his neck when he was buried, and it was. Now, she was his legal wife. It was a secret. Um, he went in contravention of the Royal Marriages Act of 1722, um, uh, not to marry without the king's approval. He managed to sort of coerce her into a marriage, which, although it was legal, was not literally uh, accepted. Um, his parents didn't know about it, although they sort of suspected. Everybody in London talked about it. Um, she never talked about it. She still went as Mrs. Fitzherbert. She still had her own house. She still had her own friends. They seem to have had perhaps two children. No one is entirely sure if they were his or someone else's. She always proclaimed that they were her niece's children. Um, but um, one of them ended up in America as a rather respected Catholic priest. Um, but at some point, George as you will see, spent an enormous amount of money. He was um, <clears throat> unaware of what money was. He just kept spending and spending and spending. And at about the age of 24, he asked for more money from Parliament. Parliament said, no, you are not going to have any money. You already have 60,000 pounds a year. What do you do with it? Um, he went to ask his father. His father said, no, you have 60,000 pounds a year. What do you do with it? He borrowed from friends. He borrowed from Georgiana Devonshire. He borrowed from other friends. And he was basically told, if you want an increase in your allowance, you need to marry. So he married. Against his will, a first cousin, Caroline of Braunschweig, Germany. Um, she is here seen in three separate portraits. The portrait on the left is her as he was present as she was presented to him, um, which was not exactly as how she arrived. Um, she was brought up in a rather lax court. Um, she was 26 when she arrived in England, rather long in the tooth at the time. 
They were introduced. She was wearing her German clothes. The prince took one look at her and walked to the other side of the room with his equerry, and he said, Harris, I need a brandy. <laughs> she, on the other hand, turned to a friend of hers, one of her courtiers who came with her from Germany and saying, he's awfully fat and he doesn't look at anything like his portrait. Um, they went ahead with it. He was going to get at least 25,000 pounds more a year. Uh, he desperately needed the money. Um, I might point out that they spent all of three married nights together. Um, he thought that her hygiene was questionable. She thought he looked like a woman. Um, she was actually a rather divine creature. If you read about her, she's very funny. And she knows exactly how many mistresses he has before she's even arrived in Germany, before she's arrived in England. He, on the other hand, thinks that at the age of 26, she couldn't possibly still be a virgin. The one thing apparently that gives her away is apparently on the wedding night, she says something along the lines of, it's so large. Whereupon he said to a friend of his, how could she possibly know unless she'd seen this before? <laughs> um, and it seems that she was possibly kidding. Um, so uh, so it, it's, it's this, it, you know, it's tears before bedtime. Um, and he wept at the wedding. When the, when the, the, priest says, when the rector said, is there anyone who would like to say that this marriage should not take place? He burst into tears, um, <laughs> thinking that I am the one who could say this. Um, but so here you see her with, in portrait by Romney and by uh, Lawrence, and she was rather, she was really sort of wonderful, um, very earthy, very funny. Um, as, as she became later in life, she wore uh, great black wigs and sort of drew in her eyebrows with what looked like charcoal, and everybody adored her. The public hated him. They adored her. The, as the, the rabble thought she was fantastic. She was common. She was coarse, um, and they loved her. They loved her because she didn't have any pretensions, unlike her husband. Those three nights they spent together resulted in one child, Charlotte, on the left, um, who died in childbirth at the age of 22. She had married Prince, uh, 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 Prince of Saxe Coburg Gotha. Um, she was vulgar. She was fabulous. People adored her. Um, and she died in childbirth. And it was not only a triple tragedy, I'm sorry, double tragedy, it was a triple tragedy. The doctor was so distressed that he had not been able to save her that he shot himself. You see on the right her tomb at um, Frogmore, which is one of the most extraordinarily affecting things you've ever seen in your life. The angel on the left holds the baby and, she, and Charlotte is rising up to heaven. So now that we're here to talk about, so now we've given a bit about George. When he was a young man at the age of 18, he was given his own household, but he still had to live with his parents. At the age of 21, he was given Carlton House, which you see here on the right, on the left, which had been belonged to his grandmother, the Dowager Princess of Wales, Augusta, on the right extremely odd house. Um, his grandparents had lived in it, Frederick and Augusta of Wales. His grandmother, after her husband died in the 1740s, took over various neighboring houses and sort of cobbled them together with any number of, of our fashionable architects. You see here at the time that George has taken it over because you see a wall being demolished here on the left-hand side. But the way you got into the house was here you see the front door and this enormously long, like 180 foot long hallway that took you back to these buildings back um, on what is now Carlton House Terrace in London. So he starts rebuilding it with the help of Henry Holland, the architect. He takes it in 1783. And as with many of George's projects, he remodels what's already been there. So you see here, you see his grandmother's house, which is at the very rear, 
you see here this enormously, insanely long hole that goes all the way back. And then Holland comes in with what will become Carlton House for the, the Prince of Wales. And George was very attached to the Whig ascendancy in England, which had a very French taste. Um, Georgiana Devonshire, the young Duchess of Devonshire, was wild about France. Um, George was as well, and Henry Holland was fascinated by France. The Brooks Club, that great um, exclusive club in London, which which designed and had first caught the Prince of Wales' eye, so he hired him to design this house, which would then sit behind a great screen of columns, which Holland was inspired by, by the Hotel du Subise in Paris and the Hotel du Condé. So here you see what would take up that entire block of what had been the Dowager Princess of Wales' property. So you have St. James's Park here, you have Palmal here, and then the court, and then the, this gigantic house that would be developed once Holland got underway. Here you see what Holland developed. Here you see again, grandmother's house at the back. He's still saved uh, the blue velvet room. So you have this side of the house, this facing the park with the same bow window, which would show up through all of George's domestic projects. But you have this one section of the house where they're all low ceilings from his grandmother's time. And then this extraordinary expression of um, the latest taste of the 1780s. And here you have uh, the basement floor, which unfortunately I had to split into two sections. So you have this going off to the left and this section going off to the right, which then all opened up onto St. James's Park. This is the entrance hall, which although what's, what's fascinating about George is that he never seems to have stopped remodeling anything. Um, this was almost the only room in Carlton House that remained unchanged for almost 40 years. Everything else changed. Everything else was constantly in flux. Um, Parliament was horrified because he would order upholstery, have an entire suite of furniture upholstered on the costliest yellow silk satin, only to decide two weeks later it needed to be read and figured. Um, where the, these bills just kept rolling in over and over and over, but for some reason this space stayed pretty much the same. And Horace Walpole, who basically hated anything anybody else ever did, um, except for his own taste, said that Carlton House at this point in time, the 1780s and 90s, was one of the most ravishing buildings in England, if not all of Europe. Um, George hired French decorators, uh, Guillaume Gobert, who had decorated Chatsworth for the Devonshires, and Dominique Daguerre, who had decorated Altrup for the Earls Spencer, and had also done work for Marie Antoinette. But again, this house was constantly in flux. There was a moment in some socialite's diary from about 1800 pointing out that there was a room attached to this house that remained under a tent for at least a decade. Um, parties were held in it, but no structure was built around it uh, because he, the prince couldn't decide quite what he wanted to do. So I wanted to show you some of the amazing rooms. Again, this is a later room. This is about 1820 when John Nash came in, as, as we know, who had done Regent's Park and several other amazing uh, areas of London. He was not a great architect, but he was a theatrical architect. And that is a huge part of Regency style, is the theatricalism of this. It was a backdrop to an extraordinary life. It was flashy. It was fun. There was a lot of gold, as you see here. This is the Crimson Drawing Room at Carlton House, um, which probably had about three or four redecorations over about 10 years. But this is how it was when George's daughter, Charlotte, married in this room, um, the Prince of saxe coburg Gotha. Um, but again, this idea of just incredible opulence, to go back to that idea of George wanting to be a person of consequence. 
and to be a person of consequence and to be a person with no power whatsoever. You needed to have this background. And what he created at Carlton House was basically an alternate court. His father, who was at that point starting to succumb to porphyria, which we all know resulted in the madness of King George, has his traditional court. George has his flashy court. There's a wonderful description, how flashy I'll tell you. There was a wonderful dinner that took place at Carlton House, and there was a woman in London whose last name began with a W, and she couldn't figure out why she had not received an invitation. And she was told that the invitations had run out by the time they had reached that part of the alphabet. And her rather witty reply was, that's not what I heard. Every whore in London was at that party. <laughs> People in the Regency were very witty. They didn't seem to care. Here you have the throne room on the left and one of the surviving chairs, the council chair here by Tatum that is still in the royal collection. Um, a, an enormous amount of what George IV created either as Prince of Wales or commissioned as the Prince Regent ended is still in the royal collection. So it provides a backdrop to everything, many things that we admire or, or, or certainly a backdrop to the um, British royal family at this moment. Um, but I don't think a lot of people think about that. But what I love is the sort of the insane sort of opulence of the rear of this chair, this gilt wood insanity, and then this amazing uh, a fringe that's on any number of chairs in this room. Here you see his throne. Here you have the Gothic dining room, which arrived about 1820 by Nash, which was part of this enormous an uh, enfilade of rooms at the rear of Carlton House, about 220 feet long, room upon room upon room, opening into this vast space. And so here you have this. And again, there was an 1811 dinner that uh, George hosted at the height of the Regency when he was named Regent, when his father was basically incapacitated at Windsor and uh, Buckhouse at the time. And so you have 2,000 guests and then a dinner table for 200, stretching from this room all the way to the end of the house on the side of St. James's Park with an artificial river running down the entire center of the table, which then recirculates back to the end of the table. There are fish, there are flowers, there are ferns. Everybody is amazed. And of course, all those W's are there. What they were served upon, of course, was this extraordinary piece together set of some 4,000 pieces of silver and gold tableware by uh, Ruddig and any number of other um, silversmiths. And the Prince of Wales, who never met a square of gilt that he didn't like, um, had the entire 4,000 pieces uniformly gilded, silver gilt. So you have this amazing collection that still is used um, by Her Majesty. And I mean, everything. I mean, these amazing uh, salt cellars in the shape of eagles, uh, the tureens, the punch bowl, which is looks like a, 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 a gold mine. I mean, it's quite the most crazy thing. And then all of this, again, gilded, 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 gilded. That was a, a light motif of, of the Regency, and certainly one of George IV's fascinations, because he was he was hugely fascinated with uh, the, the the French court. Uh, the Tories were all about brown furniture and roast beef. The Whigs were all about gilding and all about French French fashion and French food and having dinners of you know. 70, din 70 seven, not 70 courses, but 70 possible things you could eat, um, which explains that first slide where he's the size of his fireplace. So here you have the wonderful blue velvet room, which dates from his, uh, uh, it sits in the same place as his grandmother Augusta's time. And here you see these amazing 
old master paintings that he's begun collecting about 1790. Now we have to remember the French Revolution has released all of these extraordinary treasures onto the market. And just as Russia, Soviet Russia did in the 1920s, they're trying to raise money. So they're putting everything on the market. Who will buy this? Who will buy this? George IV, Prince of Wales. Um, he had two incredibly dissipated friends who worked as his art advisors, Lord Yarmouth, who happened to be the son of one of his mistresses, Lady Hartford, and another uh, gentleman, Walker Roberts, who was a decorator. And unlike today, where you have a single decorator decorating a house, George IV had about eight decorators who were constantly working on Carlton House. He would fire one, he would become tired of one. He would say, oh, Marie Antoinette hired that one. Why don't we bring him over from Paris? Which of course you can see how 60,000 pounds of debt can accumulate. Um, and then you realize that this house, here you have one end of the great conservatory that was um, added by Thomas Hopper about 1820. As you see, there's not a single plant in this conservatory, and I don't think it ever held a single plant, but it was called a conservatory, and it was made of cast iron and molded plaster. And then you see these, in, these incredible fan vaults that are embedded with glass and mirror and stained glass. It leaked like mad. So constantly, this was always being repaired. George's houses were always being repaired. And I think many of us can understand this. Um, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't so much that the workmen were terrible. It's just that he liked things to be done quickly. And the faster you do things, the less you realize how unstable walls are, how unstable floors are. And so he's constantly regenerating these houses. Here you see the other end of the great conservatory going out into the gardens. And as you see, not a single plant. Um, and as somebody pointed out at the time, no single plant could possibly live in this space because the, because the lateral light was all golden and nothing could possibly survive. I would love to know what his wife thought of this house. She gave birth to Charlotte in this house. She showed up to his parties at this house. Um, George was deeply jealous because everybody seemed to adore her because nothing bothered her. She knew about Mrs. Fitzherbert, and she once said to someone, um, how terrible that he's cast her off. She is the queen. <laughs> so here you also have, at the time, George is buying everything he can possibly put his hands on. This glorious Rubens portrait of a woman. He's buying enormous amounts of sève that belonged to the French court. He's buying Canova marbles. I mean, Canova thought he had the most tremendous taste. And when you think about George IV, you always think about the vulgarity of George IV. And there's something rather bracing and nice about that, um, because how many of us are afraid to be that way? And, and he was vulgar, but he had a tremendous eye. And you read about architects of his time, designers of his time, artists of his time, talking about he knew what was good, and he bought what was good. He never bought anything that was fake. He never bought anything that was second rate. Um, he paid through the nose for things that he probably shouldn't have. Um, but he would buy paintings for two and three times their worth. But he knew it was a good painting. Here you see an earlier part of of uh, Carlton House, he became rather fat infatuated as many English people did in the end of the uh, middle to the end of the 18th century with the Chinese style. And so here you see one of Henry Holland's rooms, the Chinese drawing room, this glorious chair that had been made for the room by a, uh, the French uh, Ebeniste Hervé. This is how it arrived in the house. And then George decided to add Buddhas on the top. So Hervé had to sort of paste them on the top to fit this room. But here you have this, here you have the console that is, that is made by Hervé. And these are still, in, obviously all of this still in the Royal Collection. These are the candelabra that you can see here on this. But you have to remember that this was also demolished within about 10 years and replaced something else. And he was constantly moving furniture back and forth, hundreds of yards, 
fabric that would arrive and he would never use, he would send to another house. Um, endless, you know, endless meters of fringe, endless meters of, of the latest. It, it's sort of amazing to me how inconsistent he is as a person of taste, but as someone who constantly recycles things into other purposes. Here is another moment of recycling. In about in the early 1790s, goes to Brighton, which at that point has become rather fashionable. Um, it's it's 65 miles from London, which might as well be China, uh, because it takes seven hours to get there by carriage. And he goes there. He it, it's a way for him to get away from his parents and away from his father's influence. It's a way for him to once again be himself. So what he does is he buys a farmhouse, and the farmhouse is about within that spot. Henry Holland has done such beautiful work at Carlton House. He drag, George drags him down to Brighton and says, I want another house. So, so, so Henry Holland creates this beautiful neoclassical, not, not entirely unawkward, but rather lovely house. Um, and here's, you see the rear of it, um, as just a, a getaway. Um, Mrs. Fitzherbert is still in his life. She has a house somewhere else in town that George has paid for, with perhaps the children that nobody knows are his with her. And then you see within literally a couple of years, he's added statues to the parapet. Um, here you see, this is where the public road was in Brighton. Now, He's a little bored. I mean, this is pleasant enough. It's charming. You see, he's added balconies. You know, I want balconies. I need to walk around. And imagine that there are all these people who are wandering here in Brighton, looking at your house, looking at you walking along here. Yeah, Prinny, how are you? Um, that sort of thing. I mean, he, he adored his public, even though the public was rather um, tired of him sometimes. So he brings Holland down. He says, I need something fascinating. I need something diverting. I need something that has nothing to do with my father. <laughs> and uh, that's what he got. Um, I need to go back here. This is the pavilion at Brighton. Okay, now you have to imagine this insane house. Um, uh, this is in literature at the time. Um, the, the, the Indian world is in literature. It's part of the British Empire. Um, so he cre so he asks Holland to create this Mughal fantasy, which of course has nothing to do with India, unless you've been smoking an enormous amount of opium. Um, but here you see, you see everybody in Brighton fashionable set wandering up and down, and here's the prince's house. You might as well be in a suburb. I mean, it's just sitting on the road, which is rather fascinating to me. So, uh, so here you see, this is the exaggeration of the artist, slightly exaggerating what we see now. Um, and it is the most amazing thing. Metternich, the German statesman came and he said, 700,000 pounds of renovation and it's still not fit to live in. <laughs> And it was the most extraordinary house. And what I think is really extraordinary about it, to go along with this idea of constant renovation, sorry, the original house, the technology of it, George loved technology. He loved anything new and modern. So you'll see these clear story windows, these puncturings through the domes, through other rooms. In the evening, he would, have servants set out to set fires on the property so that when you were dining in the house, there was light coming in as this great sort of fantasy. Which is like, what the hell is going on? Um, but again, it's all the China. There was more than 4,000 pounds spent merely on lanterns. Um, Frederick Crace of the great decorating company, Crace, created this, this sort of mad, insane, skylit um, Chinese fantasy, chop suey fantasy. And it is beautiful. I don't know how many of you have been there, but I, I posted on Facebook that I was coming to Charleston and, and going to be talking about this house. And a, a British friend of mine said, 
I get indigestion every time I drive past that house. Whereas an American friend of mine in France had visited for the first time and she said, this is the most fabulous place I've ever been in my entire life. Um, so you, you, you either love it or you loathe it. Um, and it is one of the most, it's like walking into this gigantic piece of marzipan. It's, it's, it's pink and it's red and it's blue and pale green. And, and here you see you know, all of these vaguely Chinese things. I mean, nobody from China would ever have seen these, um, but they are sort of based on um, 18th century Chinese porcelains, which of course were a step away from authentic porcelains. But George adored it, he absolutely adored it. So here you see Kreis, you know, creating, taking bits from Chinese porcelains and creating uh, murals and these insane, the wonderful interior stained glass windows bringing more light in from the outside into the staircase. And as you see, there's lots of gold. George, as I said, loved his gold. And then of course we have the amazing banqueting room, which I don't know where in China this could ever be. Um, and it is one of the most insane, beautiful interiors in the entire world. And if you've never been there, you have to go because your jaw will drop. Now you have to see that what's, what's divine, and everybody thought this was gym crack. Everybody thought this was just a stage set and it would fall down within mere moments. Um, this immense chandelier with the lotus blossoms holding the lights, the torchiers, being held aloft by a giant copper dragon and all of these leaves, except for the very the ones at the rear, are actual shaped copper curling into the room, painted to look exactly like banana leaves. And then here we have more um, lotus stylized lotus blossoms. And strangely, though, we're, we're having you know four thousand pieces of of um, gold leaf. China, it, this table only sat thirty six, so there were only a certain amount of people who could come. So here you have it as it is today um, with all of the, the original chairs, the original porcelains, the carpet I think is being replaced. And then here you see in this great dome, which was part of the original 1780s house that Holland had created. And then here you see, it's like that children's movie, How Do You Chain Your Dragon? I mean, it's this immense three-dimensional thing sort of descending from the ceiling. And I, I absolutely adore this house. I mean, it is completely crazy. And here you see the music room, which is a slightly calmer version of the dining room. Um, oh, the chandeliers are much bigger. Um, and then here you see one of the first events he ever had in that room. And then these, these wonderful pagodas um, that uh, some of them still remain with the house. Some of them are at Buckingham Palace. Some are at Windsor. And at least one pair ended up in New York City in Mott Schmidt's house on Sutton Place for Anne Vanderbilt. Um, who knows where they are now? But but again, this this idea of of you know the Regency being this great fantasy. Um, re England was wildly rich. They were exploring. They were there were enormous fortunes being made and enormous fortunes being lost. Um, and again, this goes again to go back to something we've desperately person of consequence. Um, he was not allowed to do anything as long as his father was alive. He, he had a phantom court, had people who uh, admired him because he was the Prince of Wales, um, not really more than anything else. It was sort of being in this, this reflected glory. Um, but then there's that wonderful moment where he could turn on you. And that's sort of the marvelous thing I love about George IV is that he was smart, he was artistic, he was talented, and he had this nasty side where he wanted to be loved by the most tasteful people in England, but he also wanted to be known as the most tasteful person in England. So there's this, this, there's this fight constantly within him. There are marvelous contemporary moments of him basically worshiping Beau Brummel, who was the best dressed man in England. And, 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 and 
George wanting to be that, wanting to be Bo Brummel, but, but feeling like that it was his natural right to be that, but he wasn't. So he's constantly learning. He's constantly trying to be better. He's constantly learning about art. Um, and I love this moment of, I, I meant to tell you something earlier, which I will, because um, by this time his wife is still with him, um, although they're, while they're separated most of the time. <clears throat> Somebody asked her about her husband, and she said, I, her father was a great general. And Caroline said, I'm the daughter of a hero, and I'm married to a zero. <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard George say anything quite so witty. Um, and, and, and that was quite good. Um, and Bo Brummel fell out eventually with George because George wanted to be the most exciting man in England. And so he cast off Brummel, who of course had as many debts as George did, only not quite as big. And at, at some point, uh, uh, the Prince of Wales uh, cast off Bo Brummel and Brummel uh, took it uh, uh, not happily. And there was a great party and Brummel walked in and there was a nobleman standing next to George and Bo Brummel said, so who's your fat friend? <laughs> the very next morning, the bailiffs arrived at Brummel's house. Um, all of the creditors were said, go for him. Um, so as you see, George was vindictive as well. Um, the marvelous thing, obviously at Brighton is the kitchen, which Nash created much later in the construction. And it was one of the most technologically advanced kitchens in all of the world, um, in terms of refrigeration, in terms of, of, of ventilation. Um, here you see these great columns created as, as uh, palm trees or banana trees. As you walk through the Brighton Pavilion, if it's a column, it has leaves at the top. Um, so here you see the great, the great, great kitchen where George would occasionally dine because it was one of sort of the eight wonders of the world in about 1815, 1820. Now, as you can imagine, this is a great stage set. So how did the satirists um, approach George? Um, here we have the great Joss and his playthings. So George playing Chinese um, with the great dragon coming down from his ceiling and looking, looking utterly ridiculous. Even more ridiculous was what they thought the court at Brighton was, was George sitting as this sort of gigantic Chinese emperor and everyone around him looking like idiots, um, wearing a, a, a little hats and, and everything. Um, I mean, people made endless fun. I love this of the, the, the what looks to be a, 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 a alligator sort of swallowing money, um, which was because this house was just colossally expensive. Now, of course, Queen Victoria finally visited this house in 1837. She had just become queen. She was 18 years old. She had been kept away from her uncles who were impossibly dissipated, George among them. Um, so she was kept sort of trapped. And she went to Brighton for the first time, um, away from her mother. And she wrote in her diaries, this is a very queer, odd place. Um, she said it was extremely hot. And when it wasn't extremely hot, it was extremely cold. Um, she thought it was very, very strange. And although she thought it was strange, it didn't mean that by the time she decided Brighton was not necessary, she didn't need it. I mean, can you imagine Victoria in Brighton? Um, it's really not her place. Um, <clears throat> she did take things with her. So you have some of the great uh, pagodas, you have some of the fireplaces, you have some of the porcelains that came with her. Because, I mean, she realized what an extraordinary house this was, although uh, she basically gave it to the city of Brighton to operate as a museum. But lots of things came to Buckingham Palace. This is the drawing room at Buckingham Palace in about 1860. And here you see the Chinese dining room at Buckingham Palace. And you see here some of the chairs from the Brighton Pavilion. You see the great panels that have come up. I mean, she incorporated them within to um, a house that George himself had renovated, as we'll see in a moment. Um, 
but so there's this whole sequence of Chinese rooms on sort of the second level of Buckingham Palace. And I think probably the one that we know most famously is the center room. This is the center room about 1873. You see one of the, one of the chandeliers from Brighton. You see um, some of the furniture. You see the great another set of pagodas. This is in 1920 when Queen Mary, the present queen's grandmother, uh, remodeled it and made it a bit more spare, but again, using uh, panels from the Brighton Pavilion. And then as it is more or less today, and we always see a bit of it when they're on, the royal family is on the balcony making a public appearance. This is the room behind them. This is George IV, still in Buckingham Palace. This is Brighton, the fireplace, the panels, the chandelier, um, the porcelains. The chairs are ghastly. Um, they, they should be the other chairs. But in any case, the, the carpet, it's, it's Brighton brought to London. And I, I love this idea of George IV constantly recycling and Victoria recycling and, and making things new. So now we have Buckingham Palace, which was, of course, known as Buckhouse um, much earlier in its life. And uh, this was a, a royal property. It had been acquired. Here you see it um, in a slightly later stage. George spent a bit of his childhood here. Here you see it as it was remodeled by his father. And again, the public being very close. You just have a fence in front of Buck House. And again, it wasn't Buckingham Palace, it was Buckingham House. Um, well, George needed to do something. We have to remember at this point, Carlton House has been remodeled so many times that it's, it's starting to fall down. There's so much that's been done to it and not thought about. Um, George has been the Prince Regent for about eight or nine years. His father has died after this long period of porphyria. And so George is now the king, which means he has endless amounts of money and endless amounts of debt to get into. And so he's about 60 years old, 1820. He wants to remodel Buck House into Buckingham Palace because Carlton House is too small to be a king, to have the great parties he would like to have, the great events he would like to have. So he calls on John Nash, Holland has died. John Nash, this great theatrical um, architect, he's done theater sets, he's done all sorts of amazing things. And so here we have Buckingham Palace, George III's time, I mean, George is still alive, we can see the clothing is still his era, and this is what Nash produces. Oh, here, here's Nash. And then we have what Nash produces, Buckingham Palace. So here you have this absolutely insane sort of combination of Greco-Roman temples. Um, somewhere buried in here is Buckingham House. Again, it's been, it's a costume. It's been added to the palace. You have that wonderful marble arch where the carriages would go through into the great U-shaped um, uh, uh, palace, into the courtyard. Here, once again, you see how close the public was at the time. Here you have the marble arch, which has been moved away um, to another part of, uh, not, not too terribly far away in Hyde Park. But this is, this is what the carriages would go through. This is how you entered this. Now, here is the palace as Nash extended it. Here is basically the original Buck House, and then all of this, just these immense rooms, more than 100 rooms added, so that George had, um, this was his Versailles. He wanted a Versailles, and he needed it. Um, England was enormously powerful at the time. Um, he had uh, just been crowned king. He needed an amazing new property, and so this was Buckingham Palace. So here you see, as it is today, Buckingham Palace, you see his original palace hidden behind the facade that was initially added by Queen Victoria in the 1860s or 70s. 
Um, this, this is what it looked like when she added it. Uh, the stone turned out to be wildly friable. So she had, so her son, uh, Edward VII, had it uh, remodeled, resurfaced by Ashton Webb in a style that's been called, uh, the, the, sorry, in the style that's been called um, the Ritz. So this is sort of like the Paris Ritz added onto the palace. But I love the fact that, that George is still here. George is still inside this palace that we see uh, in newsreels, in weddings. Um, I don't know about you, but I watched the Sussex's wedding like eight times in a row, um, that sort of thing. But I, I love the fact that, that we, we, we know Victoria, we know Edward VII, we know George VI, we know uh, this monarchs that came after, but that George is very embedded in what we think of the monarchy, uh, the backdrop of what he did. So here you see, this is what the main, the grand stair at Bucking, Buck House was, with these marvelous murals by Vario everywhere. This is the grand stair at Carlton House by Nash. This is the grand stair at Buckingham Palace by Nash, recreated in a fashion by George IV. This is a great theatrical moment of walking up the stairs and then this sort of great, extraordinary sort of fantasy moment. Um, he was able to bring together the 400 odd old master paintings, stubs, everything else, and be able to create the great picture gallery, Skylit by Nash, again about 1820, 1825, still extant. Um, I adore this room because how many places can you have four fireplaces in one space? Um, but these, again, these had all hung in Carlton House. Um, nothing in Brighton, but these were very much Carlton House images, called Carlton House pictures. The white drawing room, again by Nash. This great double height space um, that is almost exactly the way it was when George the Fourth created it with Nash, the same furniture he brought. You know, here is the Carlton House desk he brought from Carlton House, chairs that he brought from Carlton House. I mean, there is this, this sense of continuity. Although Morel and Sh Sharon did these, but again, this came from Carlton House, the fireplace, mantle, as you see here. Again, this recycling, this constant recycling of things. Um, here you have the, the, the blue drawing room um, at Buckingham Palace. Again, Nash. Again, George IV. Um, the only thing that's really changed from this moment. I mean, this is the furniture that George IV commissioned. The only thing that's really changed are the columns, which were originally painted, uh, which are now painted to resemble onyx, and had back then had been painted to resemble uh, porphyry. Here you have uh, the, the great dining room, again, with chairs from Carlton House. Again, around the Carlton House table. Nash, again, creating this great, spectacular state rooms for this enlarged Buckingham Palace. And here you see our George looking over um, his great creation. Um, here you see one of the, the, one of the, this great series of state rooms Again, George IV, again Nash, leading into uh, George's drawing, uh, George's throne room, which here, as you see, this extraordinary space. And I, I, I behoove you to buy Ashley Hicks's new book about Buckingham Palace, um, a descendant of the royal family, and he has spent uh, an, a summer photographing the palace. Um, and this is one of his photographs of the um, throne room. But again, this is what George IV would have known. Um, and these are chairs from Carlton House. I think you'll remember these from his throne room, either end of that table. And of course, you, if you're going to keep remodeling everything in your, your king, you have to have Windsor. Um, so here you have Windsor, which again is a fake castle anyway. Um, it's medieval, but it was added onto enormously in the 17th century by May for George the, uh, for Charles II. And, and of course, now it's George's. He has to do something with it. He calls in not Holland, he calls in Wyatt, who changed his name eventually to Wyattville. So Geoffrey Wyatt, who was a great Gothic revivalist at the time, or becoming a great Gothic revivalist. So here you see... Um, 
Windsor Castle as it is going down here. This is one, so here you have Wyattville. Again, as I said, very fashionable. Here you see Windsor Castle behind him, very pridefully painted with one of his great commissions. This is one of the little houses called Nonsuch that uh, Wyattville had done for another client about 1802. George IV knew about it. He found it wildly attractive. George was a great, he loved literature. He was very much under the influence of Sir Walter Scott. And so then he just said to Wyattville, after seeing this, can you come in and take care of Windsor? Take care of Windsor. Um, I mean, think about that. So what he did, so here we have Windsor at the great, this, again, this is one of George's creations, this insane long walk. And then here you see, this is what George came onto, Windsor. It was a bit of a hodgepodge of architectural bits. So when Wyattville came in, so you see this, this is what Wyattville turned it into. So it's much more medieval, it's a stage set. It's medieval, but not really medieval. It's, it's progressing, it's presenting the British crown the way George IV thought it should be. But again, it's all sort of costume. Brighton was costume, Carlton House was costume. Windsor is a certain kind of costume. Here you see what uh, Wyatt was presented with. And here is what he said, this is what it could be. I mean, again, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an elaboration of what came before, but it's a falsehood. And it's an incredibly beautiful falsehood. It's, 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 again, it's a backdrop to a very theatrical king and a very theatrical moment. And here you see the, the upper part of Windsor, again, added uh, new windows, replacing all of the arches, with much more elaborate windows based on medieval precedent, but not medieval in the slightest. Um, and here you have that same section of Windsor we saw before, and then he's created a whole new entrance to go into the state apartments. Again, an amazing sweep of space, Charles II's time, there must've been about 20 rooms, um, and Wyattville basically gutted everything to create something more spectacular with George's uh, desire for this great sort of parade of rooms. Again, gilding, again, all of what he's brought from Carlton House, filling this medieval castle, all of the state rooms, which everyone was wildly impressed by, obviously. And here, nothing has really much changed since George's time. Here we have um, the crimson drawing room, with uh, furniture that he commissioned, along with bits that he had done for Carlton House, paintings that he had done for Carlton House, chandeliers that came from Carlton House. Again, multiple decorators because he could never settle on a single human. Um, but this is sort of one of uh, the great uh, views of Windsor in the, I believe it's the 1850s, 60s. You see the same room, here it is, here it is again. Chandelier has changed. Uh, but the room is pretty much the same. George really loved these sort of long rooms with a bay window in the middle, as you will remember from Carlton House, his grandmother's house. That back room, that back stream of rooms with the flanking parlors, the flanking drawing rooms, and then this great big bow window. He did the same thing at Windsor. Here you see these wonderful Morel and, and Seddon uh, chairs. Um, here you see this is from Carlton House, as we saw earlier. I was in the Blue Velvet Room. <clears throat> but these, these, these spaces, although they have been damaged over the years through fire and reconstruction, the feeling is still very much 1825, George IV. Here we have his dining room, again with the, with the Carlton House chairs. He must have had a million of them. Um, but, and again, more of this gold service, this 4,000 piece. You couldn't see a human across from there. You'd be stuck with whoever sat next to you. Um, but then again, everywhere, you see everywhere the service, this incredible gold service, this, this, this amazing, you know, gilded, glamorous moment that, that George was, again, 
a man of consequence. A man of consequence has a great deal of gold, and he certainly fulfilled that. And it's here you see the, a very bad photograph of that dining room as it is today, but um, beautifully restored. And I think one of the other things that we think about about English architecture and English design that we all admire about English design is the wear and tear, the age of rooms being used for hundreds of years. George liked his rooms to be as if they were made the day before. Um, <clears throat> which takes an enormous amount of money, an enormous amount of debt. So everything is constantly being regilded, reupholstered, refringed, everything. So the rooms that you see them now, although they're incredibly bright with all of this gold, this is what George would have known. This is what he would have wanted. This is what he liked. Um, this is what impressed people. Um, the green library, which was originally built as a library, now it's a drawing room. But again, this is in Queen Victoria's time, 30 years after George has died in 1830. Um, again, his great big window, central window, overlooking the countryside. Um, as you can see, it was built as a library. And then as it is today, um, the, really the only thing that's changed are the chandeliers and this great carpet that was made for uh, the great exhibition at the Crystal Palace, made for this room. But again, furniture is also there George would recognize this space. And we all recognize this space because it's where the queen is photographed often. Here we have this great photograph of her with her great children. And this is exactly where Annie Leibovitz of Vanity Fair photographed the queen and the Duke of Edinburgh, again, on this wonderful settee made for George IV, um, her great, great grand uncle. If I missed a great, I don't know. But again, things from Carlton House. China that he purchased from the French royal family, the great set of Sevres. Um, again, these chairs, he would have known everything. And I find that really fascinating when you think about the continuity of what we think about of the British royal family, British royal taste. I think I can safely say, and no one will throw a glass at me, um, that George IV is probably the greatest tastemaker of that entire family, probably the only person in the string of kings and queens who really had a deep abiding aesthetic love for furniture and fabrics and curtains and art. He adored his surroundings and we can still enjoy them today, even if it's only through a royal wedding. And here we have the Waterloo Gallery. This is my last, I hope this is my last bit. Waterloo Gallery, which um, George, of course, never lifted a musket, as we all know. Um, but uh, he wanted to be the hero of Waterloo, and here you have him here. So he had Nash destroy an enormous amount of rooms at Windsor to create this incredible space, the Waterloo Gallery, that was all about to, to um, uh, celebrate the heroes of that battle. Um, and here you see it as it is today. Then we have St. George's Hall, and this will be my last room, I promise. St. George's Hall, as it was in medieval times, um, a, an important part of the, the etiquette at Windsor. This is how it was during George's parents' time with, uh, again, more magnificent murals. He brings in Nash, he's remodeling Windsor again, and he decides to make it into uh, this sort of quasi-medieval hall with shields of the uh, garter recipients up above. And here you see some of them here. So St. George's Hall, Windsor. And as we know, um, here it was in the middle of the 19th century at a great dinner. Um, George's, I believe this is in George's time. And then of course we all remember 1992. Um, where it, a fire in the middle of a restoration ripped through, I believe, 12 rooms of Windsor Castle. And this is St. George's Hall um, <clears throat> at that a few days afterward. Um, to everybody's great credit and to the Prince of Wales's patronage and to the enthusiasm of the architect uh, Giles Downs, it was brought back. Um, largely to what George IV would have known. Um, I am reminded here 
and I wasn't able to, I was not able to find an image, I wish I had before this uh, talk. Uh, George IV, again, as I said, didn't lift a musket, didn't lift a, a knife unless he did it to stab himself <clears throat> to get Maria Fitzherbert to marry him. Um, he had four rooms at Carlton House that was only armor, but it was armor from all around the world. It was Japanese swords. It was Japanese armor. It was Greek. It was German. It was um, South, it was Polynesian feather headdresses and everything. And I love being able to look at this and realize that all of these great um, uh, bits of armor that George IV so worshiped, um, he actually uh, appreciated the, the bravery and, um, and certainly wanted to be one of them, uh, of the soldiers that uh, kept all of these various and sundry countries going. But I thank you all very much for coming. And um, I'm, sort of, I'm sort of fascinated that you all came because I can't even get my 17 year old daughter to listen to me. Um, so I'm really happy that you came. And if you have any questions, I know I've gone on quite too long, but if you have any questions, I'd be delighted to try to answer them. Yes. No, it's, Carlton House was demolished in 1827. Um, it was already subsiding and he was focusing on Buckingham Palace. Um, and uh, it, it just wasn't big enough. I mean, he was a king now and he needed a lot more space. So uh, Carlton House was demolished. Um, if you go there now, it's Carlton House Terrace. So it's, it's all houses. Um, and like, like I said, oh, if you go to the National Gallery, the portico at the National Gallery, the columns are from Carlton House, um, as, is, are, as are the columns at the chapel at Buckingham Palace. Again, this recycling. So if you go to London and you go through the National Gallery, and you go through the portico, you're walking through the portico of Carlton House. Thank you. One more? I was going to say, you didn't go on too long on behalf of everyone here. You could have gone on hours more. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. It's very nice of you to come. All right. Well, I'd like to thank Mitch, theatrical, theatrical character, and our friend King George IV, theatrical performance presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to remind everybody that our next event is going to be April the 16th. We're having landscape historian Mark Laird come to Charleston. Mark is working with us at Drayton Hall to help decode that landscape, and it should be an action-packed performance. I'd like to welcome you all next month. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> Good luck.